style baptism happening at the Marysville pool. Well, this morning we're picking back up in the Gospel of Mark. We're so glad you're with us this morning. Uh, if you're new to our church, just very quickly to let you know that we practice a form of preaching called expository preaching. And what that means is we believe the Bible is best taught by taking books of the Bible, then we break them down chapter by chapter, uh, verse by verse, in order to understand what they mean in our lives today. We're doing that now through the Gospel of Mark. And as we come back to our study today, we are moving out of chapter 14, and we are heading into chapter 15 which represents the final 12 hours of Jesus' life. You may recall as we came out of chapter 14, Jesus has just been arrested. He's been tried by his peers, and he is now being delivered over to the Roman government for condemnation. So with that our, as our basis, I want to kind of get us engaged this morning, get our minds and our emotions kind of engaged this morning by giving us something that we can maybe relate with a little bit with what we're about to read. And so to do that, I want to reference a very popular uh, reality TV show that some of you may or may not watch, uh, but I'm sure we've all heard of. It's an interesting television series. Uh, it Really, the, the name of it depends on the gender of the character. So for example, if it's a female character, the name of the show is called The Bachelorette, all right? If it's a male character, it's called The Bachelor. Everybody tracking with me this morning? You know, you know what show I'm talking about? Some of you are like, Pastor, I, I know I've never watched it, but I know what you're talking about. Well, basically, just so, so we can all be on the same page, because I, I know people in this room don't watch that show, but so we can be on the same page, let me kind of explain the show. The way it works, basically, is the goal is that the bachelor or bachelorette would find the, the love of their life, right? The person of their dreams. And so by the end of the season, their hope is they will get a proposal or they're going to give a proposal and they're going to get married. Very exciting. And the way the show works is at the beginning of the season, show season one, episode one, it starts with the Bachelor, Bachelorette having to, to begin a choice, a selection process of around 30 different candidates that are presented to them. And then with each episode, they go on dates, they get to know each other, and they eliminate two to three candidates at the end of each show. And they do that by either giving them or not giving them a rose, all right? And it gets very, honestly, it gets very exciting at times. It's a lot of tension, very competitive. It's interesting to watch some of the, the candidates, especially when it's the men. Like, they get real competitive, right? And they start, like, you know, backbiting each other. And they're like, well, if you, let me tell you what he's doing. And, and you know, it's like this big soap opera. Yeah, it's awesome, right? And, and really, the, what it all boils down to then is this last episode where there's two candidates left. Very exciting. Two candidates. And the bachelor or bachelorette's going to pick one of them. One of them is going gonna, is gonna to fulfill their dreams. The other one, they're going to send packing in the limo, and they're going to cry, and they're going to be all upset, and it's going to be very sad, right? Now, at this point, I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are thinking, how does Pastor Brad know so much about this show? Here's how I know it. It's Pastor Jacob's favorite show. And... <laughs> Every Monday morning, he comes in, and he tells you, guess what happened, and he's got the rundown, you know, and I, 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 I humor him, all right? So that's how I know about the show. <laughs> Just saying, didn't know, didn't know what I was hiring. Anyway, you might also wonder, how does this, this show, this reality TV show, relate with Jesus his, and his death and his arrest? Well, that's a great question, and, and here's how I would explain it. The truth is, when Jesus shows up on the scene uh, way back in Mark chapter 1, he comes at a time in Jewish history when the people of Israel are looking for a Savior, the perfect Savior, the, the one that's going to deliver them, the one that's going to give them hope, uh, the one that's going to help them in, their, in their, you know, their resistance against Roman occupation, somebody that may even reestablish the kingdom of Israel. They are looking for the perfect king. And so when Jesus comes on the scene, he becomes a viable candidate because, because of his persona, because of his teaching, because of his miracles, because of everything about him. People are like, he could be the one, right? Maybe he'll get the rose. But the truth is, Jesus hasn't always been the only candidate. And honestly, there will be some candidates that come after him that the Jews will look to. But prior to Jesus coming on the scene. There are other candidates. There are other would-be messiahs in history. 
We know this from Acts chapter 5, and we're going to get to the book of Acts this fall, but one of the things we learn in Acts chapter 5 is the gospel begins to go out, and the disciples begin to tell people about Jesus. The religious leaders are threatened by that, and at one point they have a conversation about this whole Jesus deal. Listen, listen to what the high priest says concerning former candidates for Messiah. Listen to what he says. For before these days, before the days of Jesus, Thetis rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census, and he drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in this passage, the high priest is referencing former candidates for the Messiah. And the first one is this Thetis, and apparently he has a small following, about 400 people, but for whatever reason, he's killed, probably by the Romans, could have been, you know, because of the insurrection he caused, that they killed him, and all his followers fall away. The next one is Judas the, the Galilean. He comes at the time of the census, so this is about the time that Jesus is being born. He has a little bit more of a following, but it's short-lived because eventually he's killed as well, probably for insurrection, and his followers, his followers are scattered. All that to say is, as Jesus comes on the scene, he's not the first candidate, you know, for the Messiah. Others have been considered. Others have tried to play the role, but they didn't get the rose. Jesus is different. Jesus has lasted longer than any other candidate. After three years, his numbers have grown. Thousands now follow him. After three years, he is healed, he is delivered, he is instructed to the point that the religious leaders see him as a threat. Yes, they want the Messiah, but Jesus doesn't represent the kind of Messiah they want. He's not the Messiah that they're looking for. So at this point, they're getting concerned, they're getting worried as his popularity grows, as, as, as he begins to become more and more popular, they want to stop this. They don't want him to get the rose. This could be the one the people choose. They need to sabotage this. They need to stop this. They need to convince the people that Jesus isn't the right Messiah for them. So what's their plan? How will they stop this? Well, it's a devious plan. It's a plan that will involve trickery and deception. It's a plan that will involve a Roman official it's a plan that will eventually point the people of Israel to the wrong deliverer. So that is our basis. Let's, let's pick back up as we move into chapter 15 this morning. Verse 1, listen to what Mark tells us as we dive into this chapter. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. And the chief priest accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they are bringing against you. But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man that you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Mark begins by setting the scene for this chapter as he gives us the final hours of Jesus' life. And if you recall, as we left off in 14, Jesus has been accused of blasphemy. This is the charge against him. In the Jewish culture, it's a capital offense. So with night court over and as the sun is coming up, the Jews are now, the religious leaders are now taking Jesus to the Roman officials. 
You might say, well, why are they taking them to the Roman officials? Because phase one of their plan is over. See, phase one was to secretly find a way, a legitimate way, a legitimate reason to kill Jesus. And they've done that. And the charge is blasphemy. But now they have to go to the Roman government. It says, as soon as that it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation, and the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus, and they led him away, and they delivered him over to Pilate. So this is phase two. And phase two is we got to get Rome's approval now in order to kill him. Now you might be wondering, well, why do they need Rome's approval? What you need to understand is while the Jews had the ability to govern themselves to some degree within Roman occupation and they could legislate laws and they could have trials, they were not allowed to execute anyone. And so in order to execute someone, they had to go to Rome because Rome held the power of the sword. It's called the power of the sword. They are the only ones with the right to execute anyone. And they guarded this, and there was no exceptions. So the Jewish leaders, if they want Jesus dead, they have to go to now to the Roman officials and convince them that Jesus is a threat to Rome. So how will they do that? Well, Mark says they have a little powwow. They have a meeting and they decide a way for this to take place. And it says that they made a plan to deliver him over to Pilate. Now, you, you might read that and say, well, what kind of plan is that? And what, what does that mean? Well, in order to understand their plan, we have to look a little bit deeper into, the, into this statement. So a couple of things I want you to notice. First, I want you to understand this is, a, this is a plan meant to deceive, okay? And we know this from a Greek word that they use here for the, for the word deliver. It, it's para, para, paradami, and it's this, this idea of, of, of doing something sinister or evil. And so, so what that tells us is that this is a, this is a, a plan of deception. This is, this is a plan that they will, they, of trickery, so to speak, and so you might say, well, who are they trying to deceive? Well, we know, secondly, they're trying to deceive Pilate, apparently. But, but they're also going to be, they're going to deceive the Jewish people as well down the road here. But they begin with Pilate. Now, let's, let's talk about who Pilate is. Well, Pilate is the Roman governor at this time over the area of Judea. He, his, his official title is prefect. And so he's the Roman governor. He, he arrived there in 26 AD. That's what history tells us. And one of the things history tells us about Pilate is he was a very harsh administrator. And he had a very much, a very hatred for the Jewish people. He didn't like them. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, go, it, I don't think it, it'd be too far, to, too fetched or too far to say that, that he was a Hitler of sorts in the sense that in his eyes, uh, the best Jew is a dead Jew. I mean, he just, he does not like the Jewish people. So as they come to Pilate, they, they need to de deceive Pilate into thinking Jesus is a threat. Now you might, you might automatically think, well, Pastor, why, why would they need to deceive Pilate? Because doesn't Pilate, if he hates Jews, would this not be an opportunity for him to take a Jew out, right? You would think so. But here's what you need to understand about the hatred. The hatred goes really deep. Because Pilate doesn't want to do anything for the Jewish leaders that they might be pleased with. That's a deep kind of hatred, isn't it? In other words, he's not going to take Jesus out just because they want him to. He's not going to give them that kind of satisfaction. So they know, listen, we've got to be deceptive because Pilate's not going to want to do this for, for us. On top of that, if they don't have a, a reason that Jesus has, has, you know, violated something against Rome, Pilate's not even, he's not even going to care. I mean, if it's just that they, he broke a Jewish law, Pilate's going to be like, big whoop de doo I don't care. But if it's a law that he's broke in Rome, if it's a Roman law he's broken against Caesar, then Pilate will have to listen. And so in order to get Pilate on board, they need to now convince Pilate that Jesus is a threat to Rome, which leads to phase three. Try and deceive Pilate. And I want to emphasize the word try there. Here's what they do. Listen to what Mark tells us. And Pilate asked them, are you the king of the Jews? That's the first thing that Pilate asks Jesus. Why do you think that's the question that Pilate asked Jesus? How about this? That's what the religious leaders brought to Pilate. 
They came to Pilate with Jesus and said, hey, this is Jesus, Pilate. He's claiming to be a king. Now you might say, well, what's the, what's the problem with that? Well, in Rome, there's only one king. His name is Caesar. And for anybody to claim that they're a Caesar or they're a king, that's treason. That, that is a capital offense. And so what they're wanting to do is they, they, wanna, they, want, they want Pilate to believe that Jesus is going around saying that he's a king. You see what they're trying to do? They're being deceptive. Because the truth is, Jesus has never claimed that. Not at, not at one point in his ministry did he claim to be an earthly king. Yes, he claimed to be a heavenly king. Yes, he claimed to be the son of the blessed, the son of God. And while that bothered the religious leaders enough for them to say blasphemy, Pilate could have cared less that he claimed that. But Pilate would care if he was claiming to be like Caesar. So in order to, to get Pilate on their page, they twist the truth ever so much. Enough that Pilate goes to Jesus and says, so are you claiming to be a king? How does he respond? Mark says, and he answered him, you have said so. And the chief priest accused him of many things, and Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. Jesus apparently doesn't have much to say to this. All he says is, if that's what you say. Which apparently kind of surprises Pilate, probably because if somebody was brought before you for treason, right, you would think they would defend themselves. Oh, hold on, time out. That's not what I meant, okay? I said I was a king, but, but they, they're twisting at Pilate. That's not, but Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't say anything, and it, it amazes Pilate. He just, he's blown away by this. Question then is, what does Jesus mean by that? If, he, if well, all he says is, if you say so. Well, the, the good news is that the Apostle John gives us a little bit more detail into the conversation because the conversation actually continues. Listen to this. Listen to what the Apostle John tells us. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? See, there's all this clamor going on, and they're making all these accusations, and Pilate's like, time out. And he pulls Jesus into his quarters, into private, and out, out of the earshot of the Jews, he says, so are you the king of the Jews? And this time out of earshot, Jesus gives him a little bit more of a detailed answer. Listen to what he says. Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it about me? In other words, Pilate, are you the one asking is it you that want to know this, or is it somebody else has told you this? Interesting question. Listen to what Pilate says. Pilate says, am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Pilate says, listen, I'm not a Jew. I, Jesus, I don't care who you are. I could care less who you are. All I want to know is, are you making this claim? What is it you have done? What is it you have said that would cause them to say this about you? What does Jesus say? Listen to what he says. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. To be honest, I would have loved to see the look on Pilate's face when Jesus said this. Because Jesus basically says, yes, I'm a king, but not of this world. You know, like, yeah, I'm not the king of planet Earth, but I am the king of Mars. I am the king of Venus. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Yep, I'm that king, right? I mean, he could have, that's crazy. I mean, at this point, Pilate, Pilate's thinking, I don't have a king here, I've got a nut here. And so he asked him again, so, so are you a king or aren't you? Jesus continues, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I came into the world. To bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Jesus says, you know what, Pilate, if that's what you want to call me, fine, I'll be a king. But that's not why I came into the world. I didn't come in to rule as a king. That's not why I'm here. I came here to show men how to get to God. I came here to show them salvation. I came here to show them and tell them 
the truth. It's to this point that Pilate gets a little agitated. Agitated because he now realizes what's going on here. He now understands this guy isn't guilty of treason. He's guilty of not agreeing with their theology. And they are using me to try to get him killed. Nice try. Nice try, guys. Not going to happen. Pilate said to him, what is truth? Pilate's like, you know what? I'm not having this conversation. This, this, is, a, this is a stupid, religious, philosophical deal between you and your people. Get out of here. I'm done with this. It says, after he, Jesus, said this, Pilate went back outside to the Jews and said, I find no guilt in him. Nice try, guys, but I'm not buying it. I see what you're trying to do. And now that he's agitated, Pilate is going to have a little fun with them. He's going to maybe, in a way, pay them back a little bit or try to pay them back because apparently there's this this custom he has that he would set a prisoner free, a Jewish prisoner free at the Jewish holiday, the Passover. And so he said, you know what I'm going to do though, I'm still going to set a prisoner free because in Mark chapter 15 verse 6 we read this, now at the feast he used to release for them one of the prisoners of whom they asked. And so Pilate's like, yeah we got this custom, so I'm going to release somebody and so what what Pilate's going to do is he's going to release a prisoner and he's going to put Jesus up as one of those prisoners here in a second. Now you might say, well why would he do any of that? I mean if he hates Jews, why, why is Pilate even doing this? Well, he's not doing it for himself, necessarily. He's, he's, he's not doing it really for anybody but for Rome because the last thing Rome wants is a riot. And what you have to understand about, about the Passover and that holiday is hundreds of thousands of Jews have come to Jerusalem and at this point they're excited. This is an excited crowd and they're, they're looking for the Messiah. Every year they're looking for the Messiah and the last thing that Rome wants is a riot. And so one of the things that Pilate would do is he, he, he wanted to appease them. He'd say, hey, you know, just kind of settle you down a little bit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let a prisoner go. You pick. It's kind of like what you, you do, Mom and Dad, when you go to Walmart, right? And you got a fussy toddler. What do you do? You go to the toy aisle. You put a toy in the cart to appease them. This is Pilate taking the, let's, let's go to the prison. Here, let, pick somebody out so you, and then just simmer down. Simmer down. That's what's going on here. But this time, Pilate, Pilate's like, you know what? I'm not going to let you pick. I'm going to pick who gets released. In fact, I'm going to give you a choice. Listen to what he says in verse 7. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? This is Pilate's way now of messing with these religious leaders. They've messed with him. He's messing back. Because now he's going to give the people a choice between two prisoners. Two prisoners that are exa- the exact opposite. One is innocent. He's done nothing wrong. People love him. His name is Jesus. The second prisoner, he's a murderer. He's an insurrectionist. His name is Barabbas. So Pilate puts up these two and he says, Who do you want me to release? Who do you want me to let go? Listen to what Mark says. For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. You guys tried to put one over on me? Well, here you go, egg in your face. They thought Pilate would condemn Jesus. Now he's saying he's innocent. Now he's, he's comparing him to the murderer and saying, who do you want to let go? Pilate thinks, who's going to let go? Jesus. Egg in your face, religious leaders. You thought you could deceive me? Now I'm paying you back. But the religious leaders are crafty. No, they couldn't deceive Pilate. But they will deceive the crowd, phase four. And so as Pilate presents Jesus, the innocent, against Barabbas, the guilty, the religious leaders begin to do their worst. Listen to what Mark tells us. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have them release for them Barabbas instead. Mark says the chief priests now move into the crowd. They begin to plant seeds of deception among the people. Now, you might be wondering, well, how, could, how would they do that? I mean, if, 
If Barabbas is a known murderer, insurrectionist, and Jesus is a known, you know, for nothing like that, he's innocent, how would they convince these people to choose Barabbas over Jesus? Well, here's what you need to understand. Yes, Barabbas is a murderer, but in the Jews' mind, he's the best kind of murderer. He's a murderer of Roman soldiers and citizens, the people who oppress them. Yes, he's an insurrectionist, he's a revoltist, but he's the best kind. He's revolting against Rome. He's revolting against the oppressors of Israel. See, what you have to understand is from the Jewish perspective, he could be seen as a hero. In a sense, he's the kind of Messiah they've been looking for. Somebody who would deliver them. Somebody that would give them hope. Somebody who could maybe re push Rome back, reestablish the, the kingdom of Israel. He was willing to do something Jesus wasn't willing to do for them. Choose Barabbas. He's everything you've been looking for. He will give you everything that you need. He's the perfect one for you. And the ploy works. The deception works. Amazingly, they're able to convince the people that Barabbas is the better choice. Mark writes, and Pilate again said to them, then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. Mark says, Pilate's like beside himself. He can't believe this is happening. I mean, he thought for sure they would pick Jesus. And he's like, why? What has he done? Don't give him the rose. Give the rose to Barabbas. Put Jesus in the limo. Get rid of him. Crucify him. That's what's going on here. They chose Barabbas. They've bought into the deception. They, they've been duped into thinking that he's the one that will save them, that Barabbas is the better choice. So what does Pilate do? So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, this guy's a man pleaser, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, and we'll get more into that next week, what that means, he delivered him to be crucified. Pilate now realizes he has a problem. If he doesn't release Barabbas, he's going to have a riot on his hands. He does not want this. This is, the, this is the last thing he wanted. He has now been backed into a corner. It is now egg on his face. He has no choice but to release Barabbas and send Jesus to the cross. I told you it was a soap opera. I told you it was devious and deceptive because it is. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, well, Pastor, that's, that's an interesting story. Maybe, maybe you've never even heard that perspective. But you might be wondering, what does this have to do with me and you, and how does this relate to our lives? And I would say it relates in much the same way. Because the truth is, like the people of Israel back in the first century, people today are looking for hope. People today are still looking for hope. In fact, let's just be honest. That's why some of you are here today. You came here looking for hope. You're, you're hoping there's more to life than what you've experienced. You're hoping that, 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 that there's more purpose than, than, than what you've already experienced in your life. You're, you're looking at your life and, and there's, there's things that, that are happening and, and there's things you're trying to you know, deal with and you're hoping that there's something out there or someone that could help you overcome that. And so, and so you, you, you're looking for hope, hope for your marriage, hope for your family, hope for your finances, hope for your addiction, you know, hope for your future, hope really in the midst of a world that seems to be falling apart, right? And so you're here today. And you were here a couple weeks ago and you were here last month and you're here trying to find something or someone that can take away the fear, the pain, the anxiety and give you hope. And give you hope. In fact, I would say that's why most people go to church. Why most people give themselves to religion. They, they do it because they're looking for hope. They're looking for something that can take away that pain and that emptiness in their life. And so they go on this search, right? They're like searching for, I gotta find the perfect church. I gotta find that church that'll give me hope. They're, they're looking for the perfect religion. I gotta find the perfect religion that'll help me with this. I gotta, I gotta find the perfect ritual. There's gotta be a ritual out there that'll help me. They're looking for the perfect heritage, you know, for their family. They're looking for that perfect way, that perfect someone, that perfect something that can give them hope and save them out of their situation. 
But you know what? There's danger when you're looking for hope. There's a danger you look in the wrong place. There's a danger that you would put your hope in the wrong Savior, right? There's this danger that, that like the people of Israel, like that crowd that day, that you would be deceived into making the wrong choice, that you would input, end up putting your hope in something that really can't save you. Because the truth is, is there's a real enemy out there who's trying to deceive you. An enemy that would love more than anything for, to put, for you to put your hope in something that does nothing for you. Something that can't save you. Because at the end of the day, just like the Bachelor, Bachelorette, it comes down to two choices. It really does. Two choices for your hope and salvation. God's way or your way. Those are the choices. God's way is an interesting way, one we struggle with. It takes us out of the equation. God's way is Jesus. God's way is you putting your hope in him. God's way is you believing he paid the price for your sins and that if you'll put your hope in that and you'll put your faith in that, you can be saved. Romans chapter 10 verse 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, guess what? You will be saved. That's God's way. But then there's our way. And our way is the exact opposite of God's way. Our way involves you and involves me, sinful human people trying to save ourselves, trying to find something that can help us. It involves you and I putting our hope in a Savior that we hope will, will help us. It's religious association. If I was just Catholic, if I was just Lutheran, if I was just Methodist, if I was just Presbyterian, if I was just Assembly of God, I want to make sure I get them all. I don't want to offend, I want to offend everybody here, all right? So whatever you are, if I could just be that, I could be right with God. If I just do these rituals, if I just go to church this much, if I just do and do and work and work and do all this, I'll be right with God. I'll be fulfilled finally. That's us. That's our way. And the enemy loves it. Man, he loves it. Yes! They're not looking to Jesus. They're putting their hope in themselves. They're putting their hope in a ritual, in a religion. I love it! They're choosing Barabbas. He loves it. That we would foolishly believe that our way is better than God's way. He loves that we don't think Jesus is enough. He wants us to choose Barabbas. In fact, it's what he's banking on. We see the story of Jesus going to the cross and everything seems to kind of be hand in hand. And then there's this one character that seems to interrupt the narrative. His name's Barabbas. Uh, we don't even know much about him except that he's a murderer, a leader of an insurrection, a rebel. And why he's even mentioned, sometimes I'm not so sure. It's like, what? Let's, this is about Jesus going to the cross. And so in this moment, Pilate thinks, I hold the destinies of these two men in my hand. I know the Jews have a tradition that on a holy day, I will release one of the prisoners on death row. Pilate stands on this audacious stage who now presents Jesus, son of the living God, versus Barabbas, the thug and rebel. He says, all right, who do you want? This is blasphemy. This, is, this has gone too far. There's no comparison. This is a rightful prisoner, a man who should be on death row. He's a rebel against Rome. He leads a rebellion. He murders people. He's a bad man. He's a thug and he's a crook. He deserves the chains and he deserves the crucifixion. Jesus, what has he done but heal, restore, deliver, set free? Open blind eyes, open deaf ears, heal the lame and the leper. What, what has Jesus done? 
Who do you want? We, we want Barabbas. Yeah. Give us Barabbas. People say, give us Barabbas. The Roman soldiers come up and they put the key in and they unlock Barabbas from his chains and shackles. And he walks down the platform, welcomed by all of his thug friends. Yeah, the people love me. Yeah, that's right. I don't even know who this Jesus guy is, but all I know is my people love me. There seems to be no conscience of Barabbas. There's no record of him turning to Jesus and saying, I owe you everything now, or you have set me free. No, I don't see any of that in Barabbas. God knew that. Jesus stood there, silent, for he knew the will of the Father. He said, it's fine, Father. Let him have Barabbas. For Jesus knew that the Father would have to treat Jesus like Barabbas so he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. Barabbas thought it was the people that set him free. No, 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 no. It was the love of the Heavenly Father. When I look at the story, I realize who Barabbas really is. That's me. That's you. That's us. And I felt I was reading this the other day, and I felt God speak to me. I love Barabbas. I love him. But God, he's a bad man. I love him. And I wanted him to go free. Didn't you know that he probably would have never acknowledged the free gift? Yeah, but I love Barabbas. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God sent his son for Barabbas, even the one he knew would walk away from Jesus and his free gift and never come back. He loves him. And the nerve to call on the audacity of believers to think, I got saved by grace, but now that I'm in this deep, dark place of bondage, I better work hard to get myself out. What? That's the opposite of the gospel. Are you bound? Are you held under the power of this temptation, this sin? Do you feel like it's controlling you? What are you going to do? I'm gonna shake myself free. Stop it! No, you won't! You're no match for the powers of hell and the urges of sin will not overcome it and you will never overcome it. You'll just be another statistic. There's no answer within yourself. Your own marriage, your own goodness, your own discipline, your own devotion will not save your marriage and will not save your kids. There's only one. And he's the one that took your place. He's the one that stood silently on the platform with Pilate and said, yes, let him have Barabbas. Take me. How many times have I stood on that platform with Pilate and Jesus and I'm the Barabbas and they start to take my chains off and I say, no, no, I deserve this. I deserve the guilt. I deserve the shame. I deserve the consequence. I deserve it. Jesus seems to look at me and say, No, son. Let me have it. Let me have your sin. Let me have your pain. No, God, I did it to myself. I deserve it. My marriage won't make it. This is what I deserve. I deserve divorce. I deserve poverty. I deserve sickness. I deserve it all. No! God, I, I'm so ashamed. Give me your shame. But God, what if I do it again? I'll still be here. Oh, God, I don't want to hurt you. I love you. I, I don't want to do this anymore. Give me your sins, son. This is all we got. It's all I got. It's all you got. We can play games. We can play church games. 
We can pretend like some people are better than others and that's why they're blessed, or we can all come to the honest conclusion that it's God. And it's God alone. The greatest challenge is not your discipline, your devotion, your focus. Your greatest challenge is believing the gospel. Could it be that there's a God with a love so scandalous, so wide, so deep, so vast, so high, so expansive, so welcoming, so inclusive? Let me have your sin, son. Okay. And I give him my sin. And I stand in this empty space of forgiveness and acceptance while Jesus walks off to the cross that I deserve. I see him, I see him walking to the post to be whipped. As I stand a free man, all the attention is turned now. And I feel the love of God saying, go son, live your life. I'll pay the price. Where did we get off thinking that we were gonna set ourselves free? It's still Jesus, it'll always be Jesus, it'll never stop being the power of Jesus. If his blood is sufficient for your salvation, his blood is sufficient to sustain you through every challenge and every sin and every temptation. Jesus is enough! As we close this morning, you and I are left with a choice. The question is, who will we choose? Will we choose Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God, the one who paid the price for your sins so that you could be set free? Or will you choose Barabbas, a way that doesn't bring life? way that doesn't set you free. To be honest with you, our way only leads us into deeper bondage. Who will you choose? I'll be honest with you, in our church, I think this is a real struggle for a lot of people. Because of our backgrounds, because of this, the, the, the social makeup of our community, for a lot of reasons, I think a lot of people struggle with this. They struggle with this idea that Jesus is enough. They struggle with this, this idea that, that they need more, that, you know, it has to be religious identification. It has to be something that I do. And, and, and you struggle with that, and you hold on to that, and it's keeping you from the freedom that Jesus has for you. Because Jesus needs you to come to this place where you're willing to say, you're enough. Nothing I do, nothing I accomplish, doesn't matter what I'm associated with, what church I go to, how I grew up, what my heritage is, none of that matters. Because when you put your faith in Jesus, he's all you ever need. He accomplishes what we could never accomplish in ourselves. So my question for you today is, where are you at with this? Do you believe that Jesus is enough? Or do you think you need Barabbas? I guess the real question is, who gets the rose this morning? Jesus? or Barabbas. Here's, we stand this morning. Here's what I want to do. I just feel there's people in the room this morning and, and you need to make this choice this morning. And I'm, I, I'm not, I don't want to embarrass you here, but I, I do think this is, a, this is a choice that you have to make. And I think it's a public choice. I, I think you have to, with the people in the room, you have, to, you have to be willing to say, I choose one or the other. And maybe you've chosen Jesus and that's awesome. And we celebrate that. But maybe you haven't made that choice. You've never chosen Jesus. You've, you've chosen Barabbas. You've chosen your way. Here's what I want uh, to do. I want to invite you to come down this morning, and I want you to choose Jesus this morning. And here's what I want to do. I want to pray with you. I want to I walk with you through that. And if I'm the only one standing down here at the end of this, that's fine. But I just have to believe that there's somebody in the room this morning that needs to make this choice. We had five in the last service that walked down that made this choice this morning. So if that's, what, that's you, as, as, the, as the worship team comes and as we sing, I just want you to come down and say, Pastor, I'm making a choice this morning, and I choose Jesus. If that's you, just come out. Come out of your aisle. Come down to the front. Don't be ashamed. Come forward. Come forward. 
We need to start clapping for people that are coming forward. <laughs> Who's going to join her this morning? Anybody else? You would say, you know what, Pastor? I need to make a choice this morning. I need to choose Jesus. Anybody else this morning in the room? You need to make a choice this morning. Here's what we're going to do. You're all going to celebrate here, okay? You're going to sing a song. You're going to celebrate. I want to take these three with me. We're going to go in the back room. I want to pray with them. So this is a private moment for them that we get, we get to pray together. And so you celebrate in here. We're going to celebrate in there, all right?